All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Phil Geiger. He's the vice president of product marketing at Unchained, a prominent Bitcoin financial services company. Before his involvement in the Bitcoin industry, he worked extensively in healthcare, primarily as a product manager. And before joining Unchained, Phil actively introduced Bitcoin to newcomers by explaining its underlying economics. His efforts included giving educational presentations, offering one-on-one -on -one consulting, writing featured articles for various publications, and engaging in discussions about Bitcoin and crypto on social media. And uh, yeah, man, I'm excited to talk with you today. So uh, welcome. Bom, well, thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I uh, fun fun backstory now, just off mic that uh, that you lived near me in this little tiny country. <laughs> We're That's not right. going to do it in Dutch. Oh, spare your <laughs> listeners, please. My <laughs> my Dutch is is terrible, but uh, wow. yes, I lived in Utrecht from 2015 to 2018, just cool. south of the uh, Domtore. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, we won't do it in Dutch, but I think uh, a lot of Dutch people uh, appreciate it that, uh, that you uh, at least try to, uh, to learn the language. That's not, uh, that's not yeah. for everyone. So I think it's, it's very important. Ik spreek een beetje Nederlands, maar ik heb niet geoefend in lange tijd. Dude, very good. Very good. Definitely. Thank you well. This is like a B minus. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, I'm like Let's a go. I'm like a B minus Bitcoin influencer too, <laughs> yeah. so that's great. <laughs> great, like great, right on well, par. Let's let's start there because you've been in Bitcoin pretty long. I uh, at least that's my that's my perception. But I wanted to ask you, like m most people do not get Bitcoin, you know, on the first encounter, and I wanted to ask you what what mis misconceptions did you have initially when when you discovered Bitcoin, and and how did they change? I was in college when Bitcoin was first uh, published in 2009. And I remember really early on reading, I don't know if it was Reddit or just some website discussing Bitcoin. And the the misconception that I had about it was that it was just some like video game money. I was like, why would somebody create video game money without a game that you can play uh, that's associated with the money. And it took me, it took me a few years after that, probably four or five years before I was like, wait a minute, the game is real life. And the money is, <laughs> <laughs> the money is good for, uh, the entire world. So I, I ha I was very lucky to get involved in Bitcoin and start learning about it really early. Uh, I, you know, was at an event at the end of 2014 where, a woman gave a presentation about the history of money and starting with the Isle of Yap, the, the big rye stones, of course, and then ending with Bitcoin. And it was enough of the puzzle pieces where it really started to connect for me. And then I also had a background, uh, as you mentioned, in healthcare technology. So I had the technical background, I had the economics background, and uh, Bitcoin just really made sense to me. So I spent uh, 2015, 2016, 2017 learning about it. I moved to the Netherlands at the end of 2015 and then moved back to the US in 2018. And what was nice about Bitcoin during that time is that it helped me to avoid a lot of the paperwork that you have to fill out as a as an expat from the US. If your you know, bank account gets above a certain threshold, you have to do additional tax forms. And I would just never let my bank account get too high. I would just buy Bitcoin with the proceeds. Yeah. So it was a very good time to be buying Bitcoin. Uh, unfortunately, I lost my keys in a tragic boating accident, but I was able to, you know, save some for the long term, which is great. That's that's always good to hear. I uh, I think it's interesting that that you know I heard a lot of misconceptions, but yours is the first <laughs> that I heard. You know, it's video game money, but it's not a game. But you eventually you figured out that you know real life is the game. I, I think that is actually super interesting, right? The entire point that we never learn about what is money, right? So that like money could be real in a video game if there was a video game attached to the virtual money, right? But uh, you never question the money, you know, that we are, uh, well, I always say forced to use. How, how was that for you in your upbringing? Like, did, were you taught about money? Have you... Have you ever, like, did you dive into this question before you found Bitcoin or not really? I'm trying to remember. I don't think that I ever really grew up thinking much about money. Although in high school, I read some Ayn Rand. And I do think that her kind of philosophy 
is very much aligned with the Austrian economic uh, ideals and kind of their, their philosophy. And so, and I studied economics in school where of course you don't learn about money, <laughs> uh, not in Keynesian economics at least, but in, during that time, you know, I was reading a little bit more and discovered a little bit of Austrian economics a few years later. And so that really helped me to understand Bitcoin and Austrian economics, I think does a really good job of talking about money because money makes up half of every trade that happens on the entire planet. It's one of the most important, if not the most important tool that humanity has to grow civilization. I even think it's more important than spoken and written language. You need to be able to effectively communicate value without mm -hmm. being able to communicate uh, with that person. You can just kind of point, be like, I want that. Yeah. Be 100 Here's... units. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You yeah. don't need to be able to share the same written or spoken language to be able to collaborate and transact value. And, and money is the tool that allows that to happen. And so it's yeah. super important that we have the best money available so that the trades, you know, at our, in our local community, as well as internationally are as, as efficient as possible. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I, um, you know, with this podcast, I try to talk about these, these personal stories and personal insights of the people that I talk to in the hope that, you know, we create enough different trigger or touch points for people listening where they go like, Hmm, I never thought about this, you know, and that, that is kind of like their starting point for the rabbit hole. I think you just pointed out two things. Uh, again, this is, uh, you know, you are someone who studied economics and never learned to answer the question, what is money? I've talked to many people already that have the same background. I even talked to, uh, you know, Leon Wankum. I think he's a master of economics actually. And he never learned about, oh my gosh. you know, what is money. And one I of the, the, yeah. Yeah. One of the funniest, uh, things I think in just the Keynesian economy that we have is finance professionals don't learn what is money. Wild. Yeah. They're yeah. calculating with units that they don't understand. Like you learn the calculating with the numbers, but you don't know what the numbers represent. Yeah, it's, uh, you learn investing all of the tools, yeah. all of the financial products and services. Yeah but you don't really have a solid foundation of, of the actual tool, yeah. the actual asset yeah. that you're trading yeah. money. Yeah. And I think the point to make for the people listening is don't you think that's weird? <laughs> you know, ask yourself why that is, you know, does that have any purpose? Um, yeah, super, super interesting. It, it just keeps coming back, right? The entire, and I also think that's why it's so difficult by the way, to understand this is that you don't think about this your entire life. And then this group of, group of people comes along and says, you don't know what money is. You've been lied to all of your life, right? And no one or no one ever explained this to you. And that's why I also think, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to eventually understand maybe not only Bitcoin technically, but what its place is in the world and why it should exist, you know, like explaining the problem of the paradigm that people live in and showing them that there's something else that they can move to, you know, I think... That's that's like a main topic that I'm seeing is is that people find it very hard to view the possibility of another paradigm even even existing. You know, that's that's also very opposed to to what they what they live in. But especially, you know, of course, I, I focus on millennials and I assume you're a millennial, too. I am. And I wanted to ask you, how do you experience talking to our generational peers about Bitcoin? I think a lot of my peers, at least before I was working in Bitcoin professionally and was just kind of uh, talking about Bitcoin, just as you know, I was very passionate about it and wanted to get my friends and family onboarded. A lot of my peers really liked the idea of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network treating every participant equally, because I think that there's an underlying understanding that the the way the world works is not totally fair. And if you look at the inequality metrics over time in every major economy, you can see that the wealth inequality is like growing uh, more disparate and the middle class is shrinking. Uh, the wealthier are getting wealthier, the poor are getting poorer. And I think one of the talking points about Bitcoin that resonates is that it doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you have, you can have a million Bitcoin. You could be, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto, but 
because of the way that Bitcoin works, you don't have undue influence over creating more Bitcoin or how the network evolves. Like, of course, you're going to have some influence, but by running your own node, by running the Bitcoin software just locally on your computer, which is simple to do, you can just download it, install it. It takes a few days. Then you have all of Bitcoin on your computer, all of the transactions. By doing that, you can kind of just verify your own money and you don't have to worry about you know what michael saylor is talking about or what roger Ver is talking about you can just kind of uh confirm your own transactions verify your own supply and if there's a change that's implemented to bitcoin you don't have to follow it this is one of the uh, powerful most powerful aspects of bitcoin i think is controlling your keys and being able to verify that you really do control the bitcoin that you think you have does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. And again, that's such a juxtaposition compared to the current system, right? You mentioned, you know, money is half of every transaction, but well, there's a third party that influences that transaction, right? And and with, with the illustration you just gave, I think that is one of the powers of Bitcoin is that it takes that away. So that, that's right. Yeah, with with any fiat currency right now, it's not just when you're going to the market and you're buying groceries or whatever. It's the transaction isn't just between you and the vendor. There's a third party, right? At least one third party. There's <laughs> yeah. a central bank that, you know, in the time that you have walked from your house to the grocery store has been siphoning away value from the money in your pocket or in your bank account. Yeah. And they can do that by creating more of any sort of currency, creating more dollars, creating more euros. And it doesn't require them to do any work, really. They, they literally just type in additional numbers on a computer into the accounts of the banks um, that they want to give money to, and more money has been created. But what that means is the value of your money has been diluted. Yeah. And also for the vendor, right? Like when when they shake hands, basically, right? Or they exchange the good and and the reward. From that moment, like at that moment, it's equal, right? Because they said, "I want you know two units of a dollar for this uh, apple, whatever," right? But once the vendor receives the dollar and the and the and the good is gone, right? Or someone provided their service, for example, the same thing happens because they have the dollar in their pocket, but it keeps devaluing, right? So. They gave away their good or service, but they are still being robbed in that sense. That's right. Yeah. Every, every single person in an economy has to out, uh, you know, deliver value to somebody else in order to earn money. Every single person except for the central yeah. bankers. Yeah. It's just an, an inherently unequal, unfair 
system. And it's funny, I think in 50 years, when we move to a form of money that treats everyone equally, we will look back at central banking as if it was a lobotomy or, you know, <laughs> bloodletting or some other barbaric practice that we don't do anymore because it is completely unnecessary. Like once you have a form of money that nobody can print, then everybody's treated equally and exactly. you can yeah. go about your business and save for the long run and not have to worry about, hey, tomorrow is some some random person going to just devalue my life savings. This happens all over the world constantly. It's so bizarre. And also, uh, the example I like is, let's say you have um, a person uh, who, um, yeah, I always use the example of building a shed for someone. I don't know why, but let's say you build a shed in the backyard, right? If someone does that in the UK, someone does that in Congo, someone does that in Malaysia, right? They expend, they all expend the same energy in the same amount of time. You know, let's say they all do it in 12 hours and, you know, uh, exact same uh, calories and all these things. But because they get different rewards, that energy and that time is valued in a different way, which is absurd, you know? And if we have a fair money or at least an equal money that anyone in the world can use, right? Then the person in Congo can be paid the same in the same value as the person in Malaysia, as the, as the person in UK. But even, even with this small example, I love how there's like many hooks for different people, right? Like people are different, are, are, are wired differently. So one person will be like, oh yeah, time and energy is scarce. I should get like a scarce reward, not an infinite reward, right? And the other, other person will be like, huh, so if they make more currency units, then the existing units, uh, you know, are devalued. Uh, nobody ever told me that, you know? And right. that's what I love about Bitcoin with, with the rabbit hole in general. It's, it's for me, the rabbit hole is maybe not, yeah, it's deep, but it's also, it has so many touch points, right? Because eventually money does rule everything around us in that sense, because it is that tool for, for commu communication. Well, and you touched on something that's really important and it's the only thing that is more scarce than Bitcoin is our time here on earth, right? Yeah. We we're not going to live forever. Some people think that they might be able to, you know, cheat death for a little while longer, but ultimately our time on earth is totally scarce. And so why would you trade your super scarce time for a form of money that isn't scarce? Yeah. It's, that's it's very simple, simple right? It really yes. is. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's it's simple, not easy. I say, right? right? It's it's very hard to understand, and and even the, I mean, I'm thinking about the pizza lady now on Twitter, right? Like, uh, yes. I, I mean, if if you say there's a thousand units of a currency, you know, and you can buy anything in the world with it, what happens to the value of one currency unit when you introduce, you know, another thousand units? The, it, it's so basic to understand that you know the existing units lose lose value but just that just that example is so far uh, yeah like like it's hard to understand for people in some way like what what do you think is behind that like what's the main thing people need to like learn or i also want to say like un unlearn before they can understand bitcoin the main thing that people need to unlearn before understanding bitcoin I mean, I think it's just that money is actually made worse when there is a human being ma actively managing it. You know, we grow up in this in this world where every single currency that exists is managed by some central bank, but this is really just a blip in human history. For most of human history, you know, gold was the strongest form of money, or at least for the last 5,000 years. Um, and that kind of emerged naturally. There was nobody centrally coordinating that gold was going to be the best money. It just has the best properties. And I think maybe it's another thing to just, not, not to unlearn, but to learn is that money is a tool. And just like any tool that exists, a hammer, you know, a computer, different tools have different properties. And there are certain properties that make a tool better at its job or worse at its job. If you buy a hammer from Walmart, it's not going to be as good of a hammer as you might get at, you know, yeah. a nice boutique hardware store. They're both hammers. Um, same thing with money. Um, there's money 
yeah go ahead, go ahead yeah no like i'm thinking if the hammer keeps changing all the time right like when you buy it it's rock hard and you and you put a few nails in 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 the wall but then a week later it's like jelly <laughs> right or, right if, uh, yeah well, that, i mean if it's made with it low quality sense. if it, if yeah. it's made with low quality materials and you're using it, it it's going to break um and the same thing is true with money if you have a money that's managed by a central authority and they do a bad job then the money is going to be less effective at what it's supposed to be used for which is as a form of uh storing and communicating value and yeah. so if you can't protect value with it, then it doesn't do a good job at 50% of, you know, what money is good for, which is storing value. I think yeah. a, another thing that a lot of people, uh, maybe here's a good one that people can unlearn is that, uh, money is actually, it's actually more important that money is effective at storing value than it is at transferring value. So a lot of people think that the primary use case of money is spending it. And I would argue that spending money is what happens when you're done using the money. So yes. you, you use your money by saving, well, you gather yeah. it, you save, I'm, you know, just like with any, anything else, like, um, I use a hammer by holding it into my, in my hand. When I'm done with a hammer, I will put it on the shelf or I can give it to my friend. Same thing with money by earning money and storing my value in it that's when i'm using it and when i'm done using that money i'll give it to somebody else in exchange for a boat or a house or whatever groceries yeah yeah i i agree i think it's a it's an interesting thought right because if the money is bad i'm happy to give it away right but i'm not that happy to receive it right um, i am happy to receive something and and you know have it as a reward for the value that i deliver if, if it is good money, right? Because I only want to exchange in it if I'm able to save in it. Yeah, I agree. I think that's uh, in general interesting, right? Like does saving come before spending? Yeah, and you touched on something that's really important. So right now inflation is a big problem around the world. Prices of everything are going up. It's because primarily the, the money that we're using is getting a lot worse. So if you are, you know, put yourself in the position of the vendor. And if you have a job, you know, you're, you, you know, somebody is your customer, right? You're asking for a raise. You're like, my time isn't worth it. I'm, I want more money. Or if yeah. you, you know, own a restaurant, you have to raise your prices because the cost of groceries is going up and you can't, you know, make a living. And what you're saying is, Hey, the money that you have is worth less to me than, you know, the, the widget that I'm creating, the thing that I'm producing. And to your point, if you have a good form of money that increases in value over time, you might actually be okay with accepting less money today uh, so that you can save it for the long run. I, I have this joke with some friends that if you learned about Bitcoin, well, really even today, the first job that you have where you understand Bitcoin if you save effectively in Bitcoin might end up being your highest paid job ever. So if you're yeah. working today, making sandwiches or, you know, just, just doing like a, an entry level position, making coffee, if you save really effectively in Bitcoin, that might be the most money that you ever make. Cause if you were, you know, selling sandwiches for Bitcoin in 2015 and saving really effectively, you could be retired by now. Yeah. That, that that that's I I think this is one of those things where I'm going back to like the the kind of like triggers for people. This is when like I 100% agree, obviously, but it sounds too good to be true, right? <laughs> um, and and I find it interesting here yeah, that it's so easy to take that. I I I know it's a logical step, right? From okay, if I get a reward that is better, you know, harder harder money than. The, the money that other people use, then over time, more people will figure out that this is the better reward. And because it has a finite supply, you know, I don't know if you saw this, um, this image where there was like this upside down green pyramid and there was like an orange pyramid that, that went a bit viral on X, but it's like the green pyramid is all the money and, and that keeps expanding basically. And you have the orange pyramid, which is Bitcoin. You know, once you understand that all the economic energy represented in the huge expanding green energy uh, pyramid will all go into the orange pyramid which will which won't be expanding that's when you understand that you know like the simpsons said that the the price of bitcoin is infinite because if all the 
if, if all the human productivity is eventually stored in Bitcoin, then that is that value is infinite in that sense. Yeah, and I think you also said something that was interesting. You said it's simple, and I think that's true. I think I think it's not. Um, it, it doesn't require you know, the most intelligent person to understand Bitcoin, like the ideas are really simple and you should be able to intuitively understand them. It makes sense to you intuitively, but it's not easy, right? Yeah. Like holding Bitcoin from 2015 to today is absolutely not easy. <laughs> it is very difficult. Bitcoin's a different form of money than anything else we've seen. It works differently, has different properties, different tools that you need to learn. And yes, like once you once you get the why, why it's important, why I want it, it's very simple to just kind of start moving your life towards just treating Bitcoin as your long term savings. Yeah. But it is not easy to ride the roller coaster. You know, there's a lot of memes of Bitcoin as a roller coaster or, uh, you know, diamond hands holding on for dear life. It's because. Bitcoin is extremely volatile as it's going through this phase of monetization and you got to get on the roller coaster and the roller coaster has ups and downs. I mean, you know, right now we're talking and the price is something like $60,000, whereas a couple months ago it was $74,000 and people aren't used to that kind of volatility with other assets that they might own. But once you have a good understanding that, you know, the reason that I need Bitcoin is because it's a form of money with a fixed supply of 21 million that can't be debased by anyone. It helps you to weather that volatility. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I, after 10 years, I still feel, feel it when the price goes down. Right. Totally. But, but thinking about did the fundamentals change? I think that's a very good point, right? Because that, that is the entire, the entire point of Bitcoin is the fundamentals of the protocol do not change. That's the point. And, and that's, that's exactly what right. we see, right? Well, well, it gets checked every 10 minutes, but every four years with the halving, I think that is what we basically celebrate is that it, it is enforced as um, proposed. And that is very special because that doesn't happen with any other money in the world. You know, <laughs> that is the entire um, uh, point. But would you agree then that price is kind of a reflection of the understanding of people 100%. holding it? You know, yep, like that, that's just it, right? Like that's the volatility also, right? That That's what the volatility shows. I mean, if you sell, you don't understand it. If you gamble, you don't understand it. Yeah, I I, I tried trading for a grand total of like 20 minutes and <laughs> realized that I didn't have any advantage over the professional traders. And I thought about it and the advantage that I did have was saving in it over the long term. So that's just been my strategy. Yeah. But yeah, it's... um yeah, it's it's volatile, and so it's just not easy to to you know ride ride that ride those waves, and and then you just have to keep kind of going back to it. And I think of it, something that really helped me like change my frame of reference was changing my personal denominator to Bitcoin. So I start to measure things in Bitcoin, hmm. and so now when the price of Bitcoin crashes, I'm like, why is the dollar pumping in value? what's going on um, as opposed to thinking about it in terms of like, Oh, Bitcoin's crashing. I think, Oh, the dollar's pumping. And, and that's helped me a lot. It's helped me also uh, make better investments because I, you know, look at the value of homes over the last five years measured in Bitcoin and they're down about 90%, you know, in two th year 2000, uh, 2020, a house was probably a hundred Bitcoin, something like that. And today it might be more like, 10 Bitcoin or yeah. even less in some areas. Yeah. So it's uh, if you measure the world in Bitcoin as your denominator, you can kind of see um, that things that you thought were performing really well, maybe aren't performing so well, particularly in the long run, like in the short term, again, it's going to be very volatile, but in the long run, there's a trend. Yeah. I did this for the average home selling price uh, in the Netherlands from 2014 to 2024. And we went from about 220,000 in 2014 average to like 440,000 in 2024 and from about a thousand Bitcoin to seven, eight. <laughs> Crazy. And the, you know, the I, prices yeah. of your houses are collapsing. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> Against the better money, you know, I That's think right. we should, we should add that. Maybe, yeah. 
as a as a nice illustration to to my next question i i don't know if you saw my tweet but i found this really cool like advertisement from 1936 where it said like a modern home with like an image of the home and like the layout 997 dollars and you know that's the same dollars as the dollars that you guys are using now right so in 1936 a new home went for 997 dollars the utility value of the home did not go up. Like what people use a home for homes are not more popular or something. Like they're not, it's not a trend to, <laughs> to have a home, right? So, you know, did that value go up or did the value of the currency you use to price it didn't go down? And so if you, even if you adjust for inflation in today's money, that $997 would be $22,161. You know, can you build a house for $22,000 today? You know, it, no way. Obviously, obviously not. Yeah. But th that brings me to my next question. I and you mentioned central banks before, and I heard you talk in another podcast about central banks. And you said the concept of central banking is inherently communist. And I thought it was very interesting because, you know, the dumb thought I had is I thought communist ha communism had no place in the Western world. But. <sighs> I agree with you. Uh, communism, I don't think, has any place in the Western world. It's produced some of the worst outcomes in human history um, multiple times over. It's not like a fluke. It's not like the one time it was tried, it caused chaos. It's like, no, every single time it's been attempted, it's caused an absolute humanitarian disaster. And yes, central banking is inherently communist. If you read the Communist Manifesto, it's number five of the line items. Um, there's like 10, 10 pillars, I believe, of communism. And number five is that the money is controlled by a central bank. So at best, uh, the world right now is living under a system that I would call like monetary socialism. Um, but uh, we have to totally eradicate this whole concept of central banking in order to experience... Uh, capitalism and yeah. you know to some extent even i think it would be i think as a communist if you if you're really into communism for the ideals of communism um you know to, to each according to their needs i don't and treating everyone equally like i don't think that that is actually possible with having a single authority controlling the most important tool that people have to live their lives so because again, that's just like a in fundamental inequality. So, you know, I would say that it, even if you are a diehard kind of socialist, communist, this idea that Bitcoin exists without a central authority and treats every single participant equally according to how much value they've delivered to other people seems like it could could be interesting but yeah as as is written in the communist manifesto number five i believe is central banking um, the establishment of a central bank because i and i think you know if if you read closely a lot of the intentions of you know the early communists they actually just wanted to control people like they they when once they got the power it was just all about staying in power and authority and they very quickly abandoned the ideals that maybe, you know, brought about a given revolution. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about it, but I, I have all, when I think about communism, I always have this example in my mind of, uh, I think it was like this clip where a student asked something to, I think it was like Charlie Kirk or something like Oh, if I, I'm a worker in a factory, you know, and there's like 100 workers in the factory, I believe that, you know, we, we should all own a piece of the factory or something like that, right? And then he just asked a very simple question like, okay, who started the factory? Who invested in the factory? Who spent time and took risk, you know, to, you know, even attempt to build, you know, whatever the factory uh, was about? And then, you know, the response is always like, yeah, yeah, but that doesn't matter because we create the value. And then he says, but no, but this person gave you a job. Like he, he found like a, a viable business and he gave you a job, right? And it's just, I don't know, it, it's backwards for me. It's like people want something without working for it, right? And and I think, you know, if we go back to Bitcoin, the entire point is you have to work for it. Like the, the entire point is you can only, um, you know, if, when you use energy efficiently, you will get energy in in return, right? And that's a metaphor for 
for anything, whether it's a venture or a job or whatever. But I, I yeah, my, my simplistic idea of communism is people want all the benefits without doing the work. But yeah, who's creating the benefits? I don't, I don't like it doesn't compute for me. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of writings from the Austrian economists about you know the 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 breakdown in economic calculation that happens with uh, communism or socialism where there's like a central authority that's trying to plan an entire economy. Um, what, what I think, you know, socialists and communists a lot of times just don't consider is the value that is delivered by having entrepreneurs in a society like those are those the the kind of entrepreneurial endeavors are just assumed under communism or socialism yeah, like it point. just assumes that people are going to go out and create new things but if there's no reward mechanism for going out and trying to invent something create something totally new then it just doesn't really happen and that's why you don't see much innovation coming out of yeah. north korea but that's also because it's 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 you have boundaries right if there's no boundaries then you are less creative and you will feel less and you will learn less right so you, you are you you will not be able to innovate I, I mean that's that's kind of my idea like if there's just like okay everyone is equal and everyone is going to be entrepreneurial like that yeah i don't know that's not i don't know it just not, doesn't work in, in my, in my well, mind it, and people just have different skill sets i mean i think this whole also, idea yeah. of people um people being inherently e equal is just it's uh, you know it's a nice idea but it's in reality it's just not practical like you know, everyone has their own unique abilities and skills and the way that they can deliver the most value to other people. And that's just going to be different. And the things that they yeah. value individually, it's totally different from somebody else. I mean, if you just look at the political climate in any country, uh, you know, there's obviously large swaths of people who have very different ideas about yeah. how things should work. Um, and I, I like... I like the diversity in ideas. I, I really appreciate that about humanity, but I think the problem comes into play where if you, if you, if you just like put a certain idea, I, ideal into, you know, unilateral power or authority over the rest of the people who maybe don't agree with those ideas, then that's when, that's when things really start to break down. And so, you know, I, 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 I believe that there's value in having a government, of course, but it just needs to be very limited in scope and they need to be much smaller, I think, than where they are today. Because I think for the most part, they're stifling innovation and stifling creativity and they're not doing an effective job of, you know, preventing, you know, yeah. frauds and criminals. I mean, all that stuff still happens. Yeah. And so you also mentioned, uh, central banks at least in the shape they are now like in the, in the form factor right like with fiat money the the role they play in fiat money system right of course before we had central banks that actually had gold that you you would have a paper for which you could redeem gold or silver in in england but now their role is way different you mentioned it's a blip in you know the entire history of money i think that that's a very good visualization right because the blip is 50 years versus thousands maybe tens of thousands of years of people exchanging value with each other and having some sort of reward you know after bartering some having some sort of reward that represents the the exchange that um that they did so just thinking about that because i think for a lot of millennials especially in a western country you know when you were younger you got some coins or a bill you went to a store you got a bread or a toy whatever and it just worked right so you never questioned it then you studied never was explained so you never questioned it but i think we both agree that you know bitcoin is the is the most important thing that people should study and understand can you try to explain why that is in one or two sentences why is that why is it the most important thing i think i think maybe beyond bitcoin just money is one of the most important things to understand and again it's because the entire world economy and the way that people collaborate with each other at scale is built off of transacting value with money it's 
and I'll just reiterate what I said earlier, I think money is one of, if not the most important fundamental tool that people need in order to build a prosperous and growing society. Like you can't really build a city beyond Dunbar's number, which is about 126 people. Um, and that's the number of people that you can trust, uh, very yeah. closely. You can't build a society larger than that without having a, a solid form of money because people are inherently going to try to cut corners and cheat. It's just human, human nature. Um, so what's nice about Bitcoin is it solves that problem for everybody across the entire globe, where now we have one form of money that we can all collaborate with and use, and we don't have to, you know, go through different, uh, different central banks and exchange rates and middlemen in order to now purchase something. It's funny, as you were talking about central banks, um, uh, moving away from having gold in reserves to just a floating paper currency, which happened in about 1971 was like when the U S as the reserve currency moved away from gold, I was thinking, and you know, one of the very first examples of a bank run was actually the bank of Amsterdam, um, in like early 1600s. I can't remember the exact mm. date, but it's the just first central say, bank in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> the first central bank in the world ended up having a bank run. It's, it just goes to show in my mind that this whole concept is, um, it's, it's just broken from the start. Like, Mm -hmm. centralizing this type of power because once you have all the gold you're like well every, not everyone's gonna withdraw all their gold exactly. at once so i might yeah. like issue a little bit more you know receipts and then uh you don't plan for when there's you know stormy weather and that's when you have a bank run i mean it's happened all over the world uh throughout history i mean even the you know the, the fall of rome a lot of that can be attributed to um the debasing of the of the currency so even with a hard currency people would try to cut corners and just, you know, literally cut corners off of the yeah, currency. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, Bitcoin is our best chance, I think, at preventing that side of human nature uh, from, you know, from now on. Um, yeah. I think, uh, I think uh, if, if you take the, you know, simplistic setup of what was the, the central bank in Amsterdam, right? People gave gold. They got a certificate, a certificate representing a certain amount of gold. That's what people used in the world to trade, right? And like all the money, or like in the world, like in in the country to trade, and then all the gold was in 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 that spot. But the administrators, or around that, right? As you said, and the same in in Roman Empire, they they yeah, just opportunity arises, you know. Yeah. And I think I think it's a good, sim more simplistic illustration of like what they call the Cantillon effect, right? Like the people who are closest to either the money creation, I would say, or like the the bearer asset that represents the the paper money. They have obviously way more opportunity to um, to corrupt to to corrupt it. And I think one of the most important things to realize. Uh, at least what worked for me is is that, you know, we would all probably think, you know, if I was in that position, I would never do that. But I think what you have to realize is that you would, you know, like uh, we are all corruptible. Maybe that's like the, the the flaw that we all have. But if we if we are in that position that we think like, oh, you know, I could do this now and nobody notices and I benefit from it or my family or I get to feed my child or whatever, you know, like all these motivations. You know, once you accept that, then it's it's at least for me, it was a very short step to realize that if we have a neutral technology that could, you know, fix that flaw for us. So we don't have to trust random other people that are in charge of, you know, a random central bank. You know, that that's, again, for me, one of those kind of like uh, <laughs> paths in my head where I went. I, I love the Cantillon effect. I think it's a really, it's another, uh, I think, thing that resonates with a lot of the, a lot of my peers is that idea where, you know, in, in 2008, the financial crisis, none of the banks really had any, any like layoffs, you know, a couple of the banks failed, but the, the big banks ended up getting massive, massive bailouts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in the U S there was the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York. And so the Cantillon effect is like the people who are the very closest to the central bank, the money printer, they came out of 2008. Fine. Maybe they got yeah. even some bonuses. They might've exactly. received bonuses. And then the plumber 
who is the furthest away from the money yes. is impacted the most. And now all of a sudden he can't afford groceries or he can't afford rent or, you know, just basic necessities. And that's just how it works. Like if you're super close to the money printer, you get first access to the freshly printed money. And then that stuff just kind of percolates throughout the economy. But people, people furthest away get impacted the most. And I think, you know, at least for Americans, like one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is this even occurs across borders. So because mm. the U.S. dollar is still the global reserve currency, although it's I think it's starting to come up into question whether or not that's going to last much longer. When the Federal Reserve prints money, it means inflation rates of weaker currencies go way higher um, just because the, the you know, the oil uh the petrodollar kind of controls the world still. And so, yeah, we export inflation. That's one of the things that the U.S. exports. And it just kind of blows people's minds sometimes. It's a brilliant, brilliant scheme. If you want to diversify your investment into Bitcoin, consider participating in a hosted mining provider like Pantheon Mining. This can potentially increase your Bitcoin holdings by 25 to 50 percent compared to just simply buying Bitcoin. Pantheon Mining provides hassle-free Bitcoin mining services tailored for private investors. With electricity prices as low as just four cents, they offer some of the best hosted mining services available. You can learn more at pantheonmining.com and get in touch with them to learn how Bitcoin mining could work for you. So, yeah, I also wanted to ask you how how has adopting Bitcoin changed? your life. I mean, I, I hear you talk and I ask this the, a, a similar question a lot, like, do you see it only as like a technical thing or also as a, as a spiritual or philosophical thing? Uh, I have a feeling uh, it's a bit more for you too. I would say it's more of a philosophical thing to me than a spiritual thing. I don't, um, it's not like I, you know, find, you know, I don't revere Bitcoin. I try not to, you know, treat it as if it was some sort of holy, you know, entity, but, you know, it's just such a good form of money that it does change the way that you interact with the world. So whereas before I might've, you know, saved up and bought a nice luxury car. Now that I price a car in Bitcoin and I think about, you know, the future and how much Bitcoin could be worth in the future, it just, makes me less likely to make that large purchase. I do spend money on high quality goods and services. So I, I do have a, a home and, you know, I have cars and stuff, but they're not like, you know, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't look at me being like, oh, he's, you know, got a bunch of, you know, he's like a super wealthy guy or anything just cause I like to just keep things really simple and, and, and uh, yeah, I don't, I just think about saving money and I think about passing on Bitcoin to future generations. So that's, yeah. I think maybe the, the other thing that it kind of has done for me is just got me thinking way more long-term. So um, I try to live more of a modest lifestyle today so that I can hopefully pass on wealth to future generations. And then of course, you know, I've been working now in Bitcoin for five years um, and that's, you know, I, every day live and breathe it. So <laughs> yeah, I try to, in my free time, I try to, you know, focus on things that are outside of Bitcoin. So good friends, I, you know, ride a lot of bikes and uh, try to get a lot of exercise and just, you know, be good to my loved ones. Yeah. I, well, it, it allows you to save for that future, right? Because eventually, and, and we briefly touched upon like the volatility part, but I heard you say on on one of your previous podcast appearances that the fixed and enforced supply schedule is what supports Bitcoin's value and everything else comes after that. I think we briefly touched upon it also with like the orange pyramid kind of idea, right? Like the more value gets into Bitcoin or the more energy, human energy, right? The productivity of people, if they want to get rewarded eventually or save their fiat rewards eventually in Bitcoin, you know, more monetary energy will get into Bitcoin, but the pyramid, the amount of Bitcoin will not grow, right? So the value of each unit eventually will grow. And yeah, so the this the transparent policy that we also mentioned, right? The, the thing that gets checked every 10 minutes and that we celebrate with the halving, et cetera. Like that is what makes Bitcoin a very like low risk invest, investment compared to other assets, I heard you say. And 
I would love to for you to like elaborate on this because I see it in the exact same way. Like I, I see myself as a risk averse kind of like control freak person, and like Bitcoin is the most rational thing that you know I ended up I ended up with. So I I love that you said that. Uh, yeah, and I'd love to hear your. There's your definitely on that. there's definitely a dichotomy with before you understand Bitcoin, it looks super risky, but what you're really honing in on is the volatility. So mm -hmm. Bitcoin is very, very volatile, but it is not, in my view, risky at all, particularly compared to some other investments that people look at as low risk. So if I look at a house in real estate, I find that to be significantly higher risk than Bitcoin. You don't know if property taxes are going to go up. You don't know if the economy is going to crash and the home value is going to dip. You don't know if the central bank is going to change the interest rates. So right now in Austin, housing prices have crashed, you know, 30% or more because interest rates are at five and a half percent and people can't afford to no. purchase houses at the previous price with that type of mortgage. Um, there's so many other risks. You know, did you get termites? Uh, is your is your town uh, has your town been disrupted? Right, like San Francisco real estate prices crashed pretty significantly because they weren't able to, you know, keep their city safe. There's so many risks to real estate. Same thing with stock market investing, right? So these, I think it was in a Sailor uh, Michael Sailor talk recently, where he said about eight or nine companies make up like 85 percent of yeah, yeah. seven was a seven companies for the s p 500 yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> like seven. a handful of companies make up like 90 yeah. percent of the growth of the s p 500 so if you're just like passively investing in your retirement accounts just in oh it's just in some index funds whatever yeah. uh you might not even be keeping up with inflation I mean, bonds, we see what's happened with bonds, right? Those are supposed to be the absolute risk-free assets and um, businesses and banks that were holding too many bonds uh, went out of business last year. We saw Silicon Valley Bank go under because interest rates went up and their balance sheet was negative and they couldn't, they couldn't last. I'm not an expert in you know all that macro stuff, but just, just know that bonds and all these like so so called safe investments they come with a lot of risk as well i mean even gold can you even verify that the gold that you own is real gold do you no. can do you have the gold <laughs> is it in your possession is it just a number on a screen what's crazy and and amazing about bitcoin is that you can you can you know you pay pay 100 bucks or so for a hardware wallet you can control the key to your Bitcoin unilaterally. You can have real true ownership and you don't even need to spend a hundred bucks. You can do it for free if you want to just use a mobile wallet or download a software from uh, the internet. But you can secure it for free and then you can verify that it is 100% pure Bitcoin yeah. on a, just a simple computer on your laptop. Yeah. And so as long as you understand, like Bitcoin's value stems primarily from the fact that it has a fixed supply of 21 million. It solved the problem of creating something digital and scarce. That's a problem that can only be solved once, as we've seen uh, from the 40,000 different shit coins that have been invented since Bitcoin's launch. Um, they're all kind of trending towards zero, particularly measured in Bitcoin, whereas Bitcoin is still increasing in value. And it's because this whole idea of something that is digital and scarce is a one-time phenomenon and then it is perfectly scarce because it is digital yeah. so there's a lot of a lot of things that are somewhat feel somewhat contradictory when you first start with bitcoin but then start to just intuitively make sense and this this whole idea of bitcoin being low risk i sleep so well at night knowing that my wealth is saved in bitcoin yeah the price is volatile it could go down 20 percent in the course of two weeks but if i just save for a little bit longer the history has showed that it goes up by yeah. you know 200% annual growth rate, something like that. I think the most important thing to add to this is, yes, the price went down, but the thing didn't change. You know, the, 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 it's about the fact that you can verify the thing that you use to store your wealth. You know, so when you talked about real estate, I thought about the sentence, you know, like, or if they defund the police, like if your neighborhood yeah. turn, turns into a ghetto, like... You, you didn't even do anything. 
someone right. else did that for you, right? And I think that is the entire thing that you can, you know, and, and of course, like prime Malibu beach real estate, you know, is probably excluded, but still, you know, I don't know, maybe there's big waves and like the cliff goes down, you know, that's the entire, that is the point. The point is that, you know, the, the thing that you use to store your, your monetary energy is dependent on all these factors that you cannot, I don't want to say control, but you cannot verify them, right? And with Bitcoin, you can verify the entire thing. So it's not only the the, the finite digital scarcity is verifiable finite digital scarcity. You don't have to adopt it because someone else says, oh, this is a good thing. No, you can verify it for yourself, right? And I, I have an illustration because you mentioned gold. It's so funny. I, 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 uh, I don't know, like a few months ago, uh, I quoted a post of a, uh, on, on X, a guy that said they had a picture of like all these um, bullions, like gold, one kilo gold. And he said real wealth. And I quote posted like, it's, it's crazy how ancient it looks, right? You're walking <laughs> around with your suitcase full of like shiny rocks, you know? And I said, literally everything in the world upgraded through technology, except a shiny rock that needs to be verified by third parties and three machines to see if it's actually real. Like, like, as you said, you like, you don't know. I don't know if, if someone gives me gold, if it's, if it's real. And that, and if someone then says, yeah, it's real. Like I, I, I need to verify it. And also someone replied and he said, I really don't understand why Bitcoiners have so much trouble identifying gold for 5,000 years. People had no issues, but Bitcoiners ha do, you know, and I think, you know, people buy gold because other people tell them to buy gold. Like it's right. a social, it's a social thing. It's not a verified thing. It's like gold is a good way to store your wealth. That's what my grandmother did. You know, like that's, that's, that, that's how we grew up, right? Like gold and silver, but it's, it's all stories. It's not verifiable. So at one point it was chosen, but yeah, it, it doesn't go beyond that. Well, even the central banks, scam each other i think there was there was a news article recently about i think gold bars that were sent over from you know china or something that had had uh tungsten in really them. so yeah yeah i mean there's but even that if the central bank says we have this amount you know this this many tons like who audits that yeah, you know nobody. so it's still it's 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 all talk no walk and i think the the difference with bitcoin is the the talk is the walk or the walk is the talk like there's no fake bitcoin you can prove your funds like all the all these things are just yeah. not possible with with all these other assets bitcoin is a conservative investment or a conservative form of savings because it reduces the amount of uncertainty that you have about the future like, you know that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. You can confirm your Bitcoin with your keys and see it on the blockchain. And with pretty much any other investment, there's so much uncertainty about it in the future. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think, one of the important aspects of any form of money is that it's just like one of the least uncertain assets. And so, you know, I don't know what the price of Bitcoin is going to be tomorrow but I feel very optimistic about the future. And maybe that's another thing philosophically that Bitcoin has done for me is made me very long-term optimistic about the world. And I think that that's very different from mm, the, a lot of the public discourse today. I mean, I keep seeing videos of like the just stop oil people oh, dude, vandalizing yeah, things and like sitting in the highways. And I think people are feeling very uh, pessimistic and nihilistic about the future yeah. of the planet. And I think because, uh, I've discovered Bitcoin and the innovations that it can bring to the world in forms of energy and food and organizations like government. It just makes me optimistic. And that that isn't to say that I'm, you know, I think in the short to midterm, I'm still a little pessimistic. I think things are going to get a little bit worse before they get better. But I think because we have Bitcoin, the timing of things getting worse is going to be condensed significantly and yeah. the transition will be faster than we might, you know, foresee. I think pessimistic is different than nihilistic. I think people, lots of people are very nihilistic. But yeah, as you said, the future is uncertain for everyone and unpredictable for everyone. So if you want to save monetary energy that you earn today into the future, you should be able to do that with a very predictable thing. You know, again, the most so, certain thing. It's so simple. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. It's, it's, but I think it's exactly that. Right. I, and, and that's what Save Dean talks about. It, it counters that future uncertainty that is similar for for everyone. 
but it could be it, it's distorted, I'd say, because people are using very risky things, not only fiat money, you know, but you know, investment in the S and P five hundred with four hundred ninety three, you know, ghost uh, zombie companies, etc. Um, you don't you don't know what is going to happen. Even and, and the fact that saving and invested and and investing got like mixed up. Mm -hmm. That is also one of these points, I'd say, right? Because stocks and and real estate, gold, well, gold perhaps less, but you know, saving versus investing. The, the fact that that is in mixed in with each other, I think, is a good point. Same as uh, I heard last week, a guy told me uh, that he liked the name of my podcast because it's called Bitcoin for Millennials, and he said this shouldn't even exist. <laughs> you know, like the fact that this is the name, it shouldn't even exist. You know, I think that is that is the thing. Like what we learned about money, the fact that we can save towards this uncertain future, that that is just not true anymore. You know, it is it is very it, uncertain. The world's changing rapidly, and I think once people start, I, I think one of the most potent um, ways to just teach somebody about Bitcoin is really this whole idea of pricing things in Bitcoin priced in Bitcoin. I think the website's called priced in Bitcoin 21. It's one of my favorite yeah. websites and you just see everything over the long run price in Bitcoin is decreasing in value. Yeah. And yeah. The, so when you start learning about it, you just think about it in long time horizons, like four years plus, and then you're going to be, you're going to have a much better experience with it. Is that also the one that says like, if you bought, Bitcoin instead of the PS5 when it came out, it would be worth this. Is that that is that that one or not? I don't know if it's the same people, but priced in Bitcoin 21, I think it's priced in Bitcoin 21.com. Um, okay, cool. They they have just all the different assets, S&P 500, Apple mm. stock. It has gold. It has bonds. It has Bitcoin mining companies. It has other cryptocurrencies and indexes and stuff like that. And you just see uh, all of those priced in Bitcoin over the long run. It's a Love very that. cool, cool way Love to look that. at things. You just mentioned you uh, ride bikes a lot, and and you shared with me before our recording that you think a lot about Bitcoin and athletes. Like Bitcoin is an endurance sport. <laughs> I think you alluded to it. You know, like holding from 2015 to now. Yeah, that's that's intense. Like, can you elaborate a bit on this? You're writing an article also. Yeah, well, this. since the Olympics are coming up uh, in a few weeks in Paris, uh, I've just been thinking about kind of Bitcoin and athletes. And in particular, you know, I, I enjoy mountain biking as one of my hobbies. Uh, I, you know, race mountain bikes just as an amateur and cool. uh, also do cyclocross racing, which I think is pretty popular in the Netherlands. Um, but uh when I'm out on long rides, sometimes I'll just come up with these kind of crazy ideas. And one of them is just uh, about all of the similarities and, and really the the personality traits, I think, that are that are similar between Bitcoin and endurance athletes. So treating. So I think, you know, one thing that we've talked about quite a bit already is uh, is the proof of work. Right. So this idea that you know, you're putting in the time and energy training and as an athlete, you know, in order to be the best in the world, to be an Olympic athlete, you're dedicating your entire life to that. And again, the most scarce resource that you have is your time here. So you're really putting in the proof of work. Bitcoin's perfect, right? Bitcoin cannot be created except through, you know, proof of work through working. You can deliver value to somebody who has Bitcoin in exchange for, you know, a good that you produce, or you can uh, set up a Bitcoin miner and convert wasted electricity into Bitcoin. But either way, you are doing real proof of work. Another yeah. thing that we touched on already in this conversation that I think would resonate really well with endurance athletes is this long time horizon, this low time preference. So when you're doing a, you know, marathon mountain bike race, which is, you know, sometimes f over four hours long of racing, like you have to be able to, uh, to stay focused and stay in the zone for a long period of time. And, and if you're training for a large event, like something like the Olympics, you know, these four year cycles are something that, uh, you're going to be thinking about. And it's so funny, like this, this article that I, I just thought of when I was writing the other day, I, I put down 10 tips that are applicable to both Bitcoin nice. and mountain biking. Um, and, you know, I think one of them, the first one is you, you can't win a, a race on the first turn, but you certainly can lose it on the first turn. So um, mm. the type of mountain biking I do is like a group start 
and everyone sprints into the first turn and you're not going to you're not going to win a race that's an hour and 45 minutes long in that first turn but if you crash you're out and so you, you've, you've seen that you know we've seen it with a lot of professional athletes all the time but same thing is true with bitcoin like if you treat bitcoin as like this gambling tool or get rich quick scheme or go in really heavily at the start before you understand what's going on you can get really burned and so you, you hear a lot of people who are like oh, i mortgaged my house for bitcoin and it price crashed and i'm out you don't have to treat it like that, that right like ride your own race like get into bitcoin at the yeah. pace that you're comfortable with and it's a progression i mean these are other kind of bitcoin tips that are also mountain bike tips like ride your own race don't <laughs> race against somebody else you're not michael saylor right you are uh yeah. brahm and you know what's going to be the right pace for you to save in Bitcoin. Um, yeah, there's there's some more tips out there too that I have that I um, love that. Trying to remember <laughs> off the top of my head, but yeah, there's so much that is like kind of uh, consistent. Like, you know, I think of even something as simple as like staying hydrated. You know, you can be the best athlete in the entire world. You can be the strongest person in the entire world, but if you don't focus on your nutrition, your water during a race, you're going to lose. With Bitcoin, like you need to. Well, first of all, literally, you know, stay hydrated so that you can be alive. But then, you know, <laughs> with your hardware wallets, for example, you need to be mm. you can't just set and forget Bitcoin. You need to periodically check on your devices and your security setup to make sure that you're still uh, that everything's still safe. Because if you've been compromised, you need to know about that so you can rotate your keys and get into a better situation. Or if you plug in your hardware wallet and it's broken, you want to know that you know sooner so that you can uh, recover your key from your uh, from your seed phrase. So you know it's like it's like pacing yourself and and making sure that you're you know taking your vitamins <laughs> during the yeah. during the, your your time saving Bitcoin. Love that fun. I love how Bitcoin invokes like these, these creative thoughts, you know, I think it's fun that, um, you know, you're just doing something with it. And I think, again, you know, the, it, it doesn't, you, up front, you don't really know who this could resonate with, right? So uh, I think it's a fun combination of, uh, of um, different elements that uh, could perhaps reach a lot of people, you know, so I think I think that's very cool. Um, I attack on all fronts you, you know uh, every you know, every every single oh. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah i think there's some delay you go ahead oh yeah i was just saying like you know uh one of the things that really got me into bitcoin early on was just being able to contribute my perspective and because Bitcoin is an open source project, you know, I'm not an engineer, I don't code, um, but I felt like I had a pretty good way of communicating about Bitcoin. And so I leveraged that with, as you mentioned at the beginning, you know, articles and presentations and so on, just written, written in a really simple fashion. And I think what I would encourage people who are listening to this podcast to do is, you know, Bitcoin is open source money. And that means that it's kind of your project to take on and you can contribute to Bitcoin in you know, whatever your specialty area is. I know accountants that are working in Bitcoin, you know, HR people working in Bitcoin, uh, legal professionals, everybody at this point, you know, every single job out there, I feel like has some role to play in the adoption of Bitcoin. Yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I also always say like, whatever you want to contribute, just do what you know. And I think, uh, I think it's needed, uh, you know, there's people who make children's books. There's people who make uh, uh, videos, you know, crazy videographers. So, you know, anything that you think you can contribute is probably um, is probably a good a good thing. I, uh, I also wanted to ask you, you know, the, the eventual goal is to, you know, Michael Saylor says never sell your Bitcoin. So we want to we want to hold it forever. But how do you see like loaning and borrowing against Bitcoin developing into the future? I know, you know, this is part of what. Uh, Unchained uh, also does, but like, what what are some obstacles or or accelerants you see in this uh, in this space? 
Right. So maybe I'll take one step back and just say like at a high level, what Unchained does is it helps people protect, manage and grow their Bitcoin wealth. Uh, and we think about Bitcoin for generations, right? And all of our products and services are built on top of a special type of Bitcoin address called multi-sig, where it's a Bitcoin address built from multiple keys that requires multiple keys to spend. So two of three, for example, Unchained has a key. Our clients have two keys. And we are a licensed financial service company in the U.S. And so then we're able to offer really awesome uh, financial products and services, such as the commercial loans, which you just mentioned. So even our loans are built on top of this multi-signature address where you can put your Bitcoin into this special type of multi-sig address where you as a client hold one key, Unchained holds a key, and then a third party key agent holds that third key. You can still verify your Bitcoin is always there on the blockchain. No single company can move the Bitcoin or lose the Bitcoin unilaterally. And you can then, you know, get a US dollar loan. Um, so it is one tool in a, a tool chest of, of different products and services that people can use in order to save in Bitcoin for longer. So instead of, you know, potentially selling Bitcoin, you can put it into this uh, loan, get access to dollars and just make those interest payments until the, the term of the loan. And then you get your Bitcoin back. Yeah. So, yeah. How, how do you see this develop into the into the future? Like, I think eventually this is something that a lot of people would would want. You know, this is uh, th the best way to also just keep keep your Bitcoin uh, physically, I'd say. Are there any challenges to to this growing like having more services like this uh, pop up there are definitely challenges to uh like something like a lending product i think what's less challenging today is the straightforward like trading desk so you can buy and sell bitcoin directly into your cold storage with unchained and things like retirement accounts so in the us you can set up a retirement account where you can put tax advantage bitcoin into an ira where you can control the keys but yeah, for the loans, I think they're a they're a bit of a tricky product just because uh, of the way that uh, loans work, right? So we have to work with capital providers, and so we go out and try to um, you know get dollars, and in in that effort of going out and gathering dollars, we're explaining, hey, yeah, we're loaning against Bitcoin, and as soon as we use that B word. <laughs> um, it, it always causes stress for the, the lenders. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the interest rates of Bitcoin loans versus something like a personal loan or a mortgage, they're always going to be a little bit higher because, you know, again, thinking about the Cantillon effect, we're a few steps away from the money printers. So yeah. the, the banks get the lowest rates and then, uh, the, we're a few steps below the banks, but, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting product and it, it has been really impactful for a lot of clients to be able to save more of their Bitcoin as, as opposed to just like selling it for dollars. Um, but you know, there are challenges to it as well. So because Bitcoin's super volatile, um, if the price crashes, then there, you could get into a margin call. So, you know, always just, you know, ski, uh, you know, within your lanes and, and don't get over your skis, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to end with uh, a little speculation. What is your global, well, I had global uh, in brackets, but uh, what's your game theory view? Any ideas about, you know, what's uh, what's going to happen? You can you, you can go any place. <laughs> I had a joke, kind of a joking tweet a few weeks ago that 2024 is, you know, the Bitcoin election here in the U.S. So both mm -hmm. political parties are coming out with a stance about Bitcoin. I think that happened maybe a little bit sooner than I anticipated, but um, pretty cool to see that. And I had a joking tweet that in 2028, the candidates are going to be arguing about which uh, Bitcoin improvement protocol they're going <laughs> to support. So which BIP they, they are in yeah. favor of. Um, I've, uh, I've been saying for a while that I think by the year 2030, the dollar will very clearly not be the global reserve currency anymore. Um, and I think we're probably still on track for that. If not, um, if it, if not a little bit sooner, I just think about these four year halvings and how much Bitcoin has grown, um, from each halving. And it, it almost, you know, what's crazy to me is that 
two presidential candidates are publicly taking stances on Bitcoin and the price isn't moving. And in fact, the price is decreasing. You know, BlackRock came out uh, with ETF and Fidelity and different countries are adopting Bitcoin and have political candidates that are out there uh, promoting Bitcoin as part of their platform. And the Bitcoin price has kind of kind of been muted for the last few months. And so I just think that that's very bullish. <laughs> Like, yeah. I don't think people <laughs> understand the, the, like the level of uh, discourse that Bitcoin has, has reached. Mm -hmm. Um, it's now, you know, I, it, my, I'm, I'm married and my, uh, my, uh, grandmother-in-law lives in Wisconsin and was a Wisconsin public school teacher. And so because the Wisconsin pension board has adopted Bitcoin. She is now a Bitcoin holder. Yeah, like, you know, that. doesn't even realize it, right? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. just how how kind of wild uh, this time is, and and you know, this is just these these large uh, entities like dipping their toes in the water, mm. and they're not any different than you or I. I mean, I started out dipping my toes in the water, and then over time, it became more and more part of yeah. uh, my overall you know wealth, and then you just go all in at some point and. And the same thing is going to hold true with all of these major organizations with billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars under management. Couldn't agree more. I think the main thing, this is also, I, I think something that could trigger the right person is that, you know, like even if you are dismissing Bitcoin, there are serious people who take it serious, right? So you have to ask yourself, are you a serious person? <laughs> you know, like if, if you dismiss it, but you, when you're honest, you know that you didn't really study it, but you still dismiss it. You know, like you have to ask yourself, am I, am I, am I serious about this opinion? Like, am I a serious person? Because there are lots of very serious pr people that, that also have way more to protect than, you know, the average Joe or Jane, I'd say, right? Like, uh, like a Bill Miller, like a billionaire, Paul Tudor Jones, like these people. Totally. Yeah. And they understand this, right? They, they, they understand it. And so for me, that's also kind of like the signal or what you say, like the price is going sideways, you know, perhaps there's some, some paper manipulation or whatever going on, but like, why is that? <laughs> because, you know, then you have more time before. Yeah. It, that's it, that's it, what it makes me so bullish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So it has a, in, you know, if it wasn't a serious asset or a serious discovery or invention, you know, I usually say discovery, you know, I don't, why are serious people paying attention? You know, it's just, again, such a simple argument, but easy to, or like difficult, not easy to challenge your, your own mind. Right. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, uh, I'm super excited to see how this is all going to play out. Like, uh, up until now, I just, uh, I, I just see Bitcoin as very entertaining. It's just very entertaining too. Yeah. To it's follow. the, it's the most interesting thing that's happening. Um, right now. And I mean, I think it's one of the most interesting things is that's happened in 5,000 years since gold monetized. Yeah. All right. Last question. And I ask everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief you will never let go? A core belief that I will never let go is that I think that a majority of people are genuine, genuinely good people. I think humans overall are trying to do what's best. And I don't think that people want to be like malicious and screw people over. I think for the most part, people are just genuinely good and there are a few bad eggs that ruin it and they get all the attention. And that's, Love. that's from, you know, I, I would say years of traveling and experiencing the world and seeing like different countries and the way that different people live. And I think for the most part, people just want to help each other. Love that, man. Great ending. Thanks so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, bro. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Let's do it again. Cheers. For sure. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.